Yeah, and Sandy, look forward to catching up with you after Paris. Really interested to hear how that week goes. And well, I'll see you. You'll be tuning you on the in TV. to, to yeah. Red Bull TV and, and listening to my commentary. I hope. Yeah, we'll speak to you after. Tom, here on the well, a different podcast couch this yeah. time, and it's been a little while since we've we've done our, our podcast caught up. Mainly just because we've just had a lot of work on the road, haven't we? And, and been in different places. And so it's nice to, to get back here and, and settle. Um, today, why don't we talk about... We've had some discussions recently around some of the social media... Things we've seen on social media in terms of uh, paddle and, and worldwide and, and how it reflects on coaches and players. And, and also, um, let's talk about me going to Paris, which I'll be going to the premiere uh, in Paris to do some work with Red Bull TV again. And uh, yeah, so a little bit of a bit of a catch up. Yeah, sounds good. Um, well, should we start with the first the, the first topic of discussion? Which, I mean, this has come up a lot, but we've seen this quite a lot recently on on social media, and it's this idea that the growth of paddle is not going to help tennis, and in a way, should should tennis help facilitate the growth of paddle if in itself potentially is a threat to tennis? Like, so if you look at a lot of federations, they've taken paddle under their wing with the idea to grow it. But actually by doing so, does that, does that jeopardize the, the health of, of tennis in that country? I think one of the hardest things when this idea of going with the federation or not, whether it's a separate federation or part of the tennis, is, is understanding the motivation and the reasons for doing it. You know, like there you're talking about, you know, to grow it. Like, and... It's so difficult, and, and I'm not talking about like the LTA UK, I'm just talking like broad generally. It's like, you know, what is the motivation for the Tennis Federation to take paddle under their wing? Is it, oh, I see the potential in this sport, I'm going to grow it. I think that this can, or we probably, think that this can help grow tennis, help grow racket sports? Or is it more of a play around oh, I see this as a challenge, I see this as a competition and actually we want to, to kind of keep tabs on it, keep control on it, or is it, um, oh, our numbers of participation might be going down, um, this is a great way to boost participation numbers. I mean, I, and I'm not saying it has to, you know, a federation is choosing one of those, but you've got to ask, what is the motivation? Why does a tennis federation want to have paddle as part of its federation and I mean you can't deny the the sport is exponentially growing right around the world I mean it's just growing faster and faster and and in the UK here it's it's one of the slowest growing countries but still it's growing fast and so you know it, it, I suppose it's around that around that motivation because really at the end of the day it is a different sport so you know you're going to get people that you know will play paddle instead of tennis and you might get people that play tennis instead of paddle i don't think there's going to be many people that are paddle players and then go to tennis mainly because the technicality of the sport is you know it's more difficult to to, to play tennis and therefore you can't get those exciting tactical rallies that you you get in paddle and you know i think i saw a, a stat on one of the posts that was saying that, you know, your average rally length in, in tennis is, is two or three or something. Whereas, you know, paddle, it's, it's easily seven, eight, nine shot rallies that you see at recreational level. So um, even though it doesn't help tennis in terms of its, you know, its growth, it does probably in terms of participation at a club though, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think going back to what you said around the Federation, on the surface, the federation that takes on paddle will be saying it's to help facilitate the growth of the sport. I mean, no, no federation is openly going to say we're taking this on to basically keep it under control or to try and almost take take that participation and put it under put it under our federation. I think that's that's where the the challenge when we speak to uh, players and club owners and coaches all over the world. There's I think that's where the mismatch is. Some federations are really driving it forward because those people at the top are are, are on board with it and they, they they want to grow the sport. But then you then you see other federations that that aren't like that. And I think that's it's a real frustration for for people in countries where perhaps, like you said, the intention isn't isn't to, to grow it as as quickly as it as it can. So do you, on that, do you think it's related to? 
the the size and strength of the tennis federation. So if I look at if I look at some of the other federations, like let's take uh, Netherlands for example, not a massive tennis federation really. Like you know they they have good players coming through obviously, but it's not it's not huge. And then this opportunity comes in a new sport, and you think, and and by you I'm thinking the federation. You think that your nation could literally get to the top five countries in the world if you applied yourself, you know, and, and because maybe your tennis might not be as strong, you think, oh, like, should we push in this direction? Um, those, are the one, those are the countries that are doing really well, I, I think, in, in, terms of, in terms of the paddle, the ones that are thinking what an opportunity this is to, to go in this direction, as opposed to thinking with a, a kind of closed or defensive mindset around tennis. You know, and, and well, in, in this country, we've got lots of traditional lawn tennis clubs that have committees that are, are you know, long, long standing tennis players that, you know, are very passionate about it. So, so it's understandably difficult to change their mind around, hey, do you want to put paddle in this club? Oh, no, I couldn't possibly take out one of our, our 10 grass courts that are being used for six weeks of the year and put in another sport where I can fit actually three paddle courts get you know kind of <laughs> triple the amount of players on the on the same court surface and drive some community and social life into the into the club i mean it's obviously a bit of a biased uh, you know but but you see what i mean it's like yeah I, I don't think it's related though to the strength of the 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 country in terms of tennis i think it is like you said it, it's the decision makers at every level so whether it's a federation i think i think it's the, the open-mindedness of, of those decision makers in a federation. Are, are those people at the top making the decisions? Are they on board with it? Or is the committee behind them on board with it? And it's the same, even if you go down to like club level, we see some clubs like tennis clubs around, around in the UK, they're, they're really on board with it. The committees are putting in paddle, they're trying to build more paddle and, and they're really on board. But then you see other clubs perhaps that do have more of a traditional mindset and their committees, they don't really want to to go down this 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 route of change with paddles. They'd rather keep those those grass courts. And I think the Nether Netherlands is an example. I just think that probably there's decision makers there in the federation that are thinking there's a real opportunity here. Um, perhaps they even play paddle themselves, love paddle, and think let's try and grow this. I I don't think personally that it's related to how strong tennis is. I think it's just how open minded and yeah, how kind of well, decision I don't makers think, are those top guys? I don't, I don't think it's, you know, the tennis in a way, like these tennis clubs that have such a small impact on the growth of paddle in that, you know, 50 clubs around the country all decide to put in two outdoor paddle courts. This is what's happening at the moment, two outdoor or paddle courts. Well, well really, the game, the game is going to be grown by these private investments, right? These, these standalone big clubs, like we saw when we went to Amsterdam, 10 indoor courts, nice cafe, bar area, gym area, like a proper standalone paddle club. And I think that's what grows the sport. If you look in these countries, you're, you're Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, like the, these ones that are growing up, we're seeing it now in the US, they're standalone paddle clubs and, and they're, they're big facilities, lots of courts, high end, like it's their premium facilities. They're not, you know, a couple of, couple of paddle courts in a, in a tennis club that is already struggling for numbers. So um, I think that's probably where, where we'll see the growth and whether the federation is on board. Ideally, the federation supports that. And then the private investment companies that are building these clubs think, oh, great, I'm going to work with the federation. Or you see lots of examples where they think, oh, well, I'm just going to do it on my own and um, you know the, the sport will grow either way because this private investment they don't need the federation they, they, they can go their own way should, should, they, should they wish. Yeah and I've, I suppose there's probably a wider discussion around tennis in general and it's, I mean we've we grew up playing tennis and really we've seen we've seen really it's a bit of a decline in, in tennis at least in our minds there's probably some people out there that would argue that that's not the case but if you look at if you look at tennis now, the 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 technical entry barriers are so high for tennis. You need lessons. You need to start from a young age. It's it's a real commitment, a real investment for parents. And well, Djokovic mentioned. Remember, we we, we had a podcast and talked about Djokovic, and he said the threat to tennis with paddle. And I think it's it's not just paddle. It's it's other sports that 
have low entry barriers, like low entry technical barriers and sports that are easy to pick up, fun to play, that are social, like paddle. I, I just think that, I think tennis probably is under threat in general from other sports, whether it be paddle or even pickleball as well. So um, I think there's probably a general discussion of, you know, is, is tennis in, in decline generally? Well, I mean, you, a big driving factor to the reason we set the platform up the way we did was our experience in tennis, wasn't it? I mean, there just yeah. wasn't the... There just wasn't the structure. There wasn't the the kind of education spread enough. It was, in a way, the performance. It was too. It was too elitist in that it was like selecting a few kids at every age, and it made it very very difficult to see a long term um, growth in sport. And actually, it's funny. I was speaking to someone about the French system, and it's it's almost the other way around in that it's so broad, and and everyone gets involved at a, a school level. I remember. When I was coaching in France, it, like the, the bell would ring at the school, and then it'd just be like a flood of kids onto the court, and there was no uh, thing around. Oh well, we're only taking the top two that we're going to support, or the top. You know, there was none of that, and so, well, it's probably a good reason why they support so many. I mean, so many top players come from from that nation, right? And, and um, France now, with paddle is they're just booming, right? I mean, they're, they're players. They've got seriously good players now for a relatively young young country in, the, yeah. in terms of the paddle well it's, uh, it's the same thing isn't it you just it's getting people in a comp competitive situation and and they're, they're doing a great a great job they're getting you know lots of courts good growth in the in the sport good education i mean their their coach education was so good in tennis and i'm and i know they're going through a similar process with the paddle so it doesn't surprise me that that they will do well i suppose the golden question around all of this is for those countries where federations have taken the sport under and perhaps aren't driving it as it could be, what's the, what's the solution to that? Does, does a country just accept that the sport is going to be very slow to grow and, and stagnate, which obviously is, is frustrating for, for all those players involved? What, what happens there? It's so difficult. It's so difficult because before the decision, you think, is this going to help? And then you think, okay, great. And it's a bit like bringing on to work with someone. You don't really know until they're actually working with you. And, and you, you, so we don't really know how the Federation, how it will go until we get to that situation. And the difficulty is that you can't just uncouple yourself. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not that easy. And, and so, you know, I think that the, the best way forward are for, for clubs and, and coaches and, and the teams involved to to really focus on driving their club forward, driving their programs and their academy forward. And, and I think, you know, if everyone does that, then, then the sport will rise. You know, a, a bit like the French system, again, it's so club driven. It's not, they're not waiting for a federation for handouts and stuff like that. They don't rely on the federation. It's, it's, it's driven from the club. And, and I think the moment that you get lots of good club operators, which, is not necessarily happening straight away in countries, but as soon as you get lots of good club operators, um, they will focus on their clubs, they will drive that, they will run their own tournaments. The whole ecosystem will, will improve, I think. And are those clubs working together or are they competing with each other? Because I suppose that, that's the other thing, is if clubs are just focusing on themselves, are they, are they just focusing on, on themselves succeeding or are they working with each other because I spoke to when I when I was at Madrid uh, and a few of the Portuguese players were talking about how the reason the sport grew so quickly there and it's really boomed and now you know there's Portuguese players coming up that are challenging those top guys is that those clubs came together and almost started working with each other I, I don't know the full story maybe it hasn't always been like that but at some point they kind of came together and said right let's let's do this for the growth of the sport is that is that the way forward? It's really interesting. I remember going to, to Portugal when Paddle was like pretty young, like at the time, it, I think they'd had it for a year or two. And, and I went down different places in, in Lisbon and Porto. And, and I remember the clubs, they were, they had really a, what you would call an experienced club manager from say a tennis or from another sport. And they recognized that the growth, like there were so few courts. So the growth of the game was, was what was a priority. And I think the difference, like if we look at say the UK, but, but we're seeing this in, in US in lots of different places is that the people building the clubs here don't have club experience. They, they have investment experience. So they're brilliant at raising money and, and you know, will pay 
a lot for a warehouse or a space, but they don't have running a club experience. And so they are seeing this at the moment as a land grab for a potential, you know, you know, very profitable industry, as opposed to thinking this is a brand new sport. We need to work together. We need to raise this sport and, and go like that. And I remember in Dubai, when I was in Dubai, the first club was built and the second one was built and and they competed and there were only two clubs in the whole city and they were competing with each other like driving each other's prices down like competing and it was only when like there was a third a fourth a fifth a sixth club that they actually said you know what there's enough for everyone let's let's kind of grow together and you know you're going to have players that play at both clubs it depends you know on, not on geography and location necessarily but uh, you know where they can go and and play with a different group of people, or they might be they might have to go shopping one day in this place and they go and play there, or you know it might be close to their work or whatever. Like, but the idea is that it's yeah, it's I, I think that clubs need to work together, like they need to, and and the ones that don't, you know, it it, it will be remembered, yeah. <laughs> and and later on when there's competition, you know, those are often the ones that that will struggle. Yeah, and I suppose you have. A unique experience of actually seeing of being in in countries where the sport has emerged in the mm. UK where if you look at the kind of the 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 industry life cycle of where the UK the US Germany these emerging paddle markets are they're a lot earlier on in their their growth and you you saw those countries that are now way further up but you've actually been there and seen it so that's that's also I guess valuable experience right because a lot of club owners perhaps don't know that and just sort of think oh this is yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think for, yeah, first off, I think anyone thinking about building a club or has built a club, like go and take a trip to Stockholm or, or Copenhagen or Amsterdam or, or, or somewhere where there is already been development of paddle. Like that would be the first thing. And then the, the, the second is, is a bit of a, like a pet peeve of mine at the moment. And I'm seeing it everywhere on social media is that, you know, someone either has built a couple of courts or they suddenly have played a little bit of paddle. They've been playing for a couple of months and suddenly they are, you know, the, the paddle expert, the paddle guru, the, you know, the, the whatever, the master of paddle. And I just and I just think it's it's a combination at the moment of the sport is very young. And so there's not a lot of coaches or, or experienced club operators in the space. And everything now is social media and social status and how do I how do I look so you know the, I don't know why players even well it's players coaches anyone why they are putting you know we see this a lot I am number 17 in my country 14 in my country six in my country like what do you know I mean did you ever do that grow like growing up as a kid <laughs> in tennis like you, I mean you were I think you were number one in in, in Great Britain for for a while in your junior career i don't of all the years that you were number one i don't ever remember you mentioning it no like not not but it was just not done and i remember every year i would compete in the quarterfinals like top eight of my ju like of my juniors for every every year for from pretty much under 12 to under 18 and i never once remember it being like a status thing like we it was it was not talked about Whereas now it's always like, and so many people that are national, you know, I'm in the national team, but they've not played for the national team. Like, I think, I think it's, it's definitely a case of it's, it's a very small pond paddle, isn't it? And I, and I think that tennis, you didn't do that because it was, there, there are just so many players well, it was it, because it was so difficult. Yeah, it was so difficult to get inside the top 10 yeah. and you had to work really hard for it that you didn't, there wasn't really a, you know, but also then well, there wasn't social media. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think I think social media is a big factor. Suddenly we're we're an expert, and and it's not like it's not just players, and it's not just coaches. It's you know we're seeing lots of paddle consultants, or you know someone that is like, oh, I can advise your club to to doing this. I, you know, I I was distributor of a, a paddle racket for six months, and I and I'm an expert, and I just. And I just feel like it's it's almost the you know it's a bad game of Chinese whispers in that you know you start you start saying that 
and then people start believing you and then you start believing you and then suddenly you're an expert giving poor advice. And I just, you know, I feel like I'm having a bit of a go, but it's, it's just like you feel like saying, right, get in the industry, spend a year in the industry, learn all you can, go to Spain, learn everything you can, you know, and, and, and then like feel free to tell, you know, to, to give advice if you are in a role where you give advice or if you're a player, like, and you really want to tell everyone how amazing you are, go, go and train in Spain and go and play a high level, compete against the best, and then then you can come back and sh share your experience as, as opposed to, you know, I, I just think this is setting people up for failure when they put, you know, I'm number whatever in, in the UK. Like our number one, Christian Medina Murphy, he would never say I'm British number one unless he's been put in that position by someone. Like he's out there playing the tour, like every week he's playing tournament after tournament and he would, he's, he's not going around saying I'm British number one so that he can play an exhibition match somewhere or do something. Like, I, I don't know, I just feel like it's, uh, it's this social, this need for status in, in social media. I think it's, it's such an early stage in the industry as well, isn't it? I, I, it's such a unique position with with a new sport like this that mm. probably there hasn't been. I'm sure there's been other sports that have come up that I'm probably not even aware of that that is new. But since social media has become such a big part of our life, and you've got a new sport, I, I think it's probably just a a stage where when, when the sport is so young and everyone is thinking about first mover and being, you know, I'm going to be the first whatever in in paddle in this country. Yeah, I think that combination of it being a really, really early stage industry plus the social media. But like you said, over time, I think it will, it will start to level off. I think it's just, but it needs, I would say but, every industry has but it, it. But it's, it, it, need, I mean, it needs to because at the moment, like when we play a tournament in, in the UK and, and we go and we'll have the first couple of rounds against players that are the best in their club and that they have a status in their club but but there's always someone better you know and then and then you know so so we go and have a comfortable match against them but then we will go and play someone better than us and and they you know they might thrash us if we play against a high level player and there's always someone better so it's like yeah i i feel like yeah it's it's important to stay grounded at this at this point at this early stage in um in paddle and talking about players that are a lot better than us. You're going to, to Paris. <laughs> Talk about staying grounded. You're, I'm going to go and watch the Premier. Yeah, 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 so this yeah. week you're going to commentate for Red Bull at the Premier in Paris. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So I'll be with Red Bull TV again, um, doing the, the like the studio, and then I'll I'll, I'll, I'll be doing some, some commentary for, for some of the men's matches. Um, I'm really excited about that, actually. I, I had a great experience in Rome. I loved it. And um, it's a, you know, the Red Bull team is fan fantastic. And the matches will be amazing. I remember going to Roland Garros like a couple of years ago. Yeah, we went together, didn't we? we yeah, saw, yeah, yeah. Right. And it was it was so empty though, wasn't it? Like, and it's I've strange. Already, it was very strange. It was kind of like it was a bit of a ghost town in a way, wasn't it? Because it it was the first year, and and paddle wasn't where it is now in France. So that there wasn't a lot of tickets that had been bought, and it was it, it was a bit weird. Um, I actually remember. I think I'd been to the French Open, the tennis that year. Hmm. So and. It's and that, like that, you're like sardines. Yeah, like yeah, you're walking struggling around. to get yeah. on a court. And, and then on, to actually go there and the outdoor courts where normally there are just outdoor tennis courts, they put paddle courts on there and you're sitting there, not yeah. really that busy. I mean, it was a really great experience, but it was, it was a really strange, strange to be there. Mm. But I'm sure, like you said, it's a lot busier now. And, and what a venue mm. to be able to do it. Amazing. And also, I mean, now, like, the sea, you know, we're... we're you know three quarters of the way through the season like you know the te like the teams are all kind of really peaking and, and working well together and I think um yeah I think it's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting I hope the weather holds out you know I know we discussed the weather a little bit but um you know October in Paris I'm hoping that you know the weather will stay will stay good because it's gonna be outdoor um so but yeah I mean I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a great event and just to give a little bit more info on your commentary so 
you commentate on all of the matches? Where can people watch or Yeah, or so see? so you can watch all the matches. Um, I think it's from quarterfinal onwards from Red Bull TV. It's free. You It's an app. It's an app. Yeah, yeah you get an app and most TVs have it as well. So you can watch it on your laptop, on your phone, etc. Um, and it's just dead easy. You just you set up a, a free account which takes you like 30 seconds and then um, it just comes up there, whatever's live. And um, in terms of commentary, last time I did um, a men's semi-final and, and the men's final, but we're, we're there, I'm there from quarterfinal onwards, like talking about the matches anyway. And then what I try and do in the games is give a bit of a, like a, a kind of educational like explanation as to what's happening in the points, why that's happening and things like that. It's obviously, it's quite difficult. I wish I could just pause the, the broadcast and explain the point, but you know, as it obviously commentating, it's like you do the point and then the next point starts and then you, you're going through. Um, and I think we're planning to do, you know, a lot of that in our content now, isn't it? Of, of breaking down um, the pro players and, and, and how they play. But yeah, I mean, if anyone is, is there during during the week um i'll be there from the thursday till the sunday um yeah please do message in our on our socials i'd love to love to see you love to have a coffee um and yeah watch some good paddle it's gonna be quite a different experience you were in rome last time i remember it mm. was like 40 it was yeah, 40 degrees and you were out in the i think out outside thing, just sweating yeah, yeah 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 so so i got my jumper <laughs> yeah this time you'll be out in your <laughs> Your rain yeah. mac yeah no it'll be good though i love paris as well it's a yeah. night i mean it's nice isn't it good food you know good good experience cheese all that kind of stuff <laughs> cheese you know, coffees nice cheese. we won't get onto the coffee. coffees yeah coffee and well, cheese let's yeah. see so let's see. sandy we're one, once you come back from paris we've also got our very first community event mm. in the uk our members community event so the idea with this is it's 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 an event it's it's an all-day event that we're doing at rocket paddle ilford in the uk and really we're we've taken it on a bit of a new spin on it haven't we mm. so previously we've done clinics at clubs and we're going to combine that with a bit more of a paddle school theme it's going to be there's going to be music there's going to be racket testing available there's going to be lots of fun things on the day as well as the training clinics that we're doing and it's the first one we're running it's packed out i think it's i think there might be one or two spaces left so if you're interested go to the paddleschool.com slash events if there are spaces by the time this goes out but sandy it's going to be really exciting we've got good coaching team down there i'm looking really forward to it yeah i mean we we thought about this a while ago didn't we just running our own days and it, it was always like do we have an, do we have enough people within our community that that would either travel to it or or be in that vicinity because a lot of our audience is is spread and so um i was really like grateful and, and happy to see that when we put that out it actually sold out quite quickly um so yeah I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it it's gonna be it's gonna be good fun and members get a discount and a, and a goodie bag for, mm. for attending so when you talk about community you mean like in our members yeah members sorry our membership yeah. our member community yeah, yeah, yeah. so members if yeah, they get they get discount. They they get a goodie bag when they come, and we're going to be running more of these events. We've got another one planned for the second of November yep. in Crawley, yep. in the UK, which is uh, for all you uh, who don't know Crawley. It's it's down yep. it's a bit further Sussex. down Sa Sussex. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And we're going to be doing our second community day there. So I don't know by the time this is released whether that will be on our website as well. But if you go to the paddleschool.com/events, that will be on there at some point. And it's worth heading to the events page anyway, isn't yeah. it? Because we've, we've got our first few holidays up there now, like the Tenerife holidays. We've got our, our community days and we're doing lots of trips. Going to I'm going to South Africa in November. Those, those dates will release at the start of October as well. Um, so, yeah, plenty of opportunity to, to get on court. <laughs>